Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students here and those online as well. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching for today. Uh, one of us can please lead. Any one of us? Go ahead, Nikhil. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time, Lord. We are here to learn your word. But I thank you, uh, Pastor Paul, Lord. Also, whatever we are going to learn, Father. You teach us, you guide us, and you lead us, Father. Give us knowledge, understanding, then we can learn, we can learn deeply your word. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. So we completed our chapter one last class. Uh, we looked at uh, personal vision and purpose. So some of the points that we looked at was uh, you were made for a purpose, so we need to discover it, walk in it, foundation. Uh, what, what we build on really matters. So what you do now will be like a good foundation as you grow up. So now we're not talking only about ministry, right? So we need to step out in our mind. We need, we need to think, okay, even professionally, personally, and uh, uh, spiritually as well, right? Thirdly, uh, your personal priorities are your foundations. Very important, be clear of your non-negotiables, right? Non-negotiables are, these are things I will not do. These are things I will do, no matter what, right? That's non-negotiables. And develop a life plan, review it continuously. We looked at, uh, uh, you know, the life of Abraham, the person that God called him to be, the place that he will be. Now, the place could be a physical place or it could be even a position. And then the purpose for which God has called you for. So. Let's get into chapter two, which is career plan. Right now, especially when we are young, right? When we when we are probably finishing your college, right? 22, 20, 21, or 22 at that age, we begin to think about our career, right? Uh, what, what do we want to be? Uh, what, what, what line of, uh, you know, what line of education or work that I should take, right? And Planning for your career is very important. Now, we need to understand that, okay, we can say, okay, ministry, I want to be in ministry. Right? And ministry is a whole big thing. You can, you know, the fivefold ministry. There are many areas in ministry. But remember that God has not gifted all of us uh, or, or graced all of us to be in full time ministry, right? Uh, now, again, I'm saying full-time ministry just for us to understand. There is no full-time and part-time ministry, right? Um, and, and so having a life plan, having a plan for my, okay, this is what I want to be. It could be a doctor, engineer, entrepreneur, uh, you know, anything, uh, whatever you want to be. Your life plan includes your spiritual life, personal health, education, profession, finances, family, and ministry. Now, know your grace, your gifts, and your skills. All of us have been, you know, God has given us certain, he has graced us and gifted us, right? So there is a certain grace in each of our lives. There's a certain kind of gifting that God gives each one of us. Right? So for example, right, this is just an example. Uh, Mother Teresa, she has a grace for what? To serve people. Now, now I don't know if you've been in a, in a colony where lepers live. Have you been? Uh, haven't been? Okay. The moment you enter the road, you'll get the smell. Yeah. It is offensive. You can do all high-end cleaning. Right, with all these high-end companies, it'll not go because it is it is such an offensive smell. Now, when you look at Mother Teresa and when she when going there nursing wounds of lepers, it is nothing but the grace of God. It is not her ability; it's the grace of God. The same way, there are people who God graces; He gives us a certain grace in our life. So there are some of them who can speak well. Some of them who can listen well. Some of them have the wisdom to just know, okay, I should do this. Right? So God gives a certain grace. 
And along with that grace, he gives certain gifts, right? And we all have gifts, right? Uh, we have, we can sing, we can talk, we can dance, we can, all of us have gifts. And so the grace and the gift go together. Because of God's grace, I can use the gift that God has given me. Right? It, so it's not it's not all the other way around. I have a gift, and so then I'll use the gift and then ask for God's grace. No. I say, God, it is your grace, and so I'm going to use the gift that you have given me. Right? Grace is God's empowering on our lives. Gifts are abilities that we discover when we are able to spontaneously and almost naturally do things. Uh, it, it's, it's a natural thing, right? So uh, let me give you this example. Uh, we had a team called the Connect Team. Uh, this is many years ago, I think uh, 2010 onwards, 2010, yes. Uh, we had a Connect Team. Now, how did this team start? There was one or two of them in, at church, and they were extremely, you know, uh, people-oriented person, right? Uh, they, they would like to go talk to people. That's all their gift is, right? They'd like to talk to people. So they came up with an idea, hey, let's form a team. So when new people come in, or even regular church folks come in, we will go and connect with them. We will, all, you, all we have to do is talk to them, make them feel comfortable. So I remember the first Sunday that I came to church, there was two guys, they came straight to me. They said, hey, uh, thank you for coming. And they made me feel so comfortable. I can, I can new people in the church. Right? Now, it was a gift. This guy at church, young man, right? He may probably in his early 20s. He knew his gift. He said, I know how to talk to people. So let me use this gift. And he started connecting. Right? And this team would meet with new people, would uh, uh, form new teams within the church. Uh, and it became very strong, very close-knit team. So that way, all of us, uh, God has gifted us and graced us with a gift. Now, it's not necessary that every gift is on the pulpit or on the stage or something that people will see and you know clap. Not necessary. Your gift can be something very simple, very small. Not many people can notice it, but it's okay. And it is something that you're doing for God. It is God's grace over your life, right? So as we faithfully operate in our areas of grace, exercise our gifts and skills, we grow in this. And the more we exercise our gifts, the more the grace increases. So the question is, what if I don't exercise the gift? Will the grace increase? If, if God has gifted me, if I don't use it, the grace is just going to be there. Right. So God is calling us, when I'm gifted you, use it so that the grace can increase. Right. So that can be any area of our life. Right. Now, explore opportunities, get input, and draw up a plan. Right. Proverbs 11.14. Would anyone like to read that? Proverbs 11.14. Where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Yes. Where there is no counsel, pe people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now, even as we explore opportunities and things that happen in our life, it's very important to, uh, to be able to come to a place of getting counsel. Godly counsel, all through the book of Proverbs, we talk, we see about godly counsel. What does uh, uh, Solomon do? And what does David? David also does that. Most of them in the Old Testament did that. As they were passing on, they would call their children, give them words of wisdom, bless them, and they would pass away. Right? It was, it was a place of saying, okay, whatever I've learned, I'm sharing it with you. You take it, you apply it. So... As we begin to explore opportunities, remember that everything that we have, the gifts and the grace, is not only for monetary rewards right, that God gives us. Right? So when God has given us a gift or a grace, it's not that we bring all of this gift and grace only to make money out of it. Gifts and grace are given to also bless people. 
That's the main reason that it's given. And out of that, right, monetary rewards, maybe after some time. But what is the, the main purpose of gifts and grace that God gives us? It is to bless people, to bless the kingdom of God, to bring people to the kingdom of God, right? So there may be some of us, you know, we, we have a hobby. Uh, and, you know, nowadays everything is online. Your hobby can be turned into a profession, right? So think if you feel that's what God is leading you towards, nothing wrong, right? But what's the point I'm trying to make? In our mind, the gift, the grace that God has given me, I'm going to use it to bless people. And it should not be only for monetary benefits, right? Remember what the Bible says? Uh, you know, uh, money is the root of all evil. Right? So if I keep thinking about it, I'll forget about my grace and my gift and what God has given in my life. I'll only think of it as, okay, let me. How can I earn more? How can I do more? Now, there's nothing wrong, right? But it's the root in our heart that we should guard our heart in the right way, right? So, without pl plans. Sorry, without counsel, Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So get counsel. I remember when uh, my early days when I joined, uh, I wouldn't let my teachers go. I make them sit. You Only when they have a meeting or something, they say, I have a meeting. Or make them sit. So I'll ask them. What about this? What about that? What about this? And they would very, uh, you know, very patiently sit and answer. There were times I'd write an email, I'd say, I want to meet, I would sit one and a half hours, two hours with them. It would be silly questions, but I wanted to know. I wanted to know, okay, if I do it this way, what will happen? If I do it the other way, what will happen? Right, and thank God. Now, I'm not saying, uh, you know, for example, if we are in the corporate sector, we may not have people who will sit with us for, uh, you know, one one and a half hours and two hours. But get counsel, uh, learn from people, ask them for advice. Okay, what should I do? Right. One of the things I did was uh, when I was almost completing my course, uh, I, you know, I began. I was always in touch with my uh, managers in my workplace and began to ask them, what can I do? Uh, what are the changes? Because it's two years now, right? Uh, two years out of IT, I've been in Bible college. So I remember saying, uh, just asking him, what can I do to improve, uh, to come back? See, now I'm two years behind, right? So all I'm doing in Bible college is singing and playing guitar. Now in the corporate sector, I'm two years behind. I don't know what's happened for two years. So I said, okay, uh, let me know what all I should learn. There are certain skills that I have to upgrade. Let me know. Uh, and so it's very important to get counsel from people, right? Especially people who are, you know, up there. They they've gone through uh, life. They've gone through seasons. Uh, when we get counsel, we establish our paths. We'll know. Okay, we can. Should I, should I take this? Should I not take this? But even with counsel, we may fail, right? We may fall. We may go through seasons. Uh, but don't be weary, right? uh, because all leaders, all of them, right, go through seasons in life. So we should be willing to go through that as well, right? So, for example, I remember this long time back. Uh, it happened. This man, elderly gentleman, he came up to me and he said, uh, "This is, he's not from our church, but uh, he came up to me and he said, I'm going through a very difficult problem, and now I don't have a home. I said, hey, you have a home. Well, I know I know that he had a home. So I said, what happened? Why, why, why are you saying that? You know? He said, I start, wanted to start my own business. So what I did was I went, I sold my home, put 50% of it in the business, and the other 50% I used for other things. So I'm left with about, not 50, but 25%. So I'm left with 25% of what I have without a home. And this 25% will last me for maybe one or two years. That's it. After that, I don't know what I do. So he said, "You know, I don't know what to do." Right now, now that this is not the right time to tell him you did a big mistake. Uh, but you know, when we don't get suggestions or we don't 
explore and ask people for opinions and advice and counsel, we may end up doing the wrong thing. And so I remember telling him, you know, just go back, see how you can, you know, retrieve whatever you have lost. Uh, but first things first, you need a home. Because he had a wife, he had children, and he didn't know what to do. So without wisdom, without counsel, is it wise? Uh, I don't know. According to me, it may not be wise. Uh, but we need to think and do what we're doing. So here comes the part of godly counsel. Counsel enables us to make the right decisions, right? So remember, life is lived in stages uh, with transitions. And those stages, we can move from one stage to another. Transitions, you need to recognize the season you're in and go along with it, right? Don't be afraid for change. You know, as, as people, we don't like change, yes? Right? But it's good. Remember that God works in seasons. All through the scriptures, when we read, when God, uh, you know, when God used people, when He chose people, He took them through seasons. Right? Uh, there was not. I don't think there was even one person where everything was smooth, and then they fulfilled the purpose of life. There's, I think, nobody. There are stages. There are seasons, and each season. We must be willing to adapt, grow, learn, and remember that the grace of God is with, with each of us. We need to recognize the season we are in and do what needs to be done in that season. Right? So I remember in uh, 2010, 29 or 2010, I knew that I want to preach. Uh, I just knew it. I, but I knew that that was not my season. Right, so I kept telling myself, I used to take a paper and I used to write down 10 years from now, one, two, three, four, five. These are the things I should be doing. And I wrote it down and I put it on the wall cupboard. So every day I see it. One of them was prepare my own sermons and preach. Right? So now the plan is put. Now who's going to prepare the sermon? The angel is not going to come and tell me to prepare it. I have to prepare it. So I began to read the word, began to prepare sermons. Who's going to preach it? I have to preach it. So sat in front of the mirror, preach it. Right? Now, initially, it looked foolish. Right? It looked like, oh man, why, why is it? Why am I doing this? I mean, it, it's not making sense. But remember that. When God is calling you, see, it says here, the season, remember the season you're in and work towards that season. Be faithful in that season. So when the moment I got the opportunity, right, I knew, okay, season has changed. I'll tell you how it happened. It's wonderful how God works. Um, I was leading worship at locations. And what happened was there was... A youth conference, a youth meeting. I, I, I don't remember what it was, conference or a meeting. Youth conference. Everyone had gone, gone away from uh, Bangalore, and they were at the youth conference. And suddenly, I got this opportunity to preach. First time. I said, oh, man, maybe this is the season. Oh, the season of uh, putting chairs and cleaning those chairs is over. I felt that way. So next year. So then I prepared. I preached my heart out. Right. I didn't do well at all. Okay, but I preached. And then I realized that hey, there's so much. It's different to preach under the mirror and different to preach front of a crowd. I realized, oh man, I need to learn so much. Right. So go back, prepare, learn. And and so those that season of you know, just uh, doing these smaller tasks is over. So I knew, okay, now I need to get to the next level, then another level. So, so as you and I prepare our plans, see, right now you all are sitting here. There'll come a time you won't be sitting, right? There'll come in those online as well. There'll come a time when you will have to step out. You'll be given the mic, and you'll have to preach, right? 
and you'll have to do what God has called you to do. So this season of sitting and listening will go. Almost done. One more year. Right? So in the season you're in right now, take what God has given you, the grace, the gifts, the calling, the anointing, use it. Prepare for the season that you're going to be in after this next year. Right? Next point. Get started. Pray, listen, and step out. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Sometimes, you know, we, we do all the preparatory work of praying, listening to God, planning, but we never get started. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you heard that saying, right? The journey of a thousand miles is, starts with a ah, one step. Oh, I want to go a thousand miles. Very good. Good vision. But take the first step. Right? So if you desire, you plan and dream, but don't act on it, we will accomplish nothing. Yeah. Right? We'll accomplish nothing. Uh, you've got to step out, do, right? Work the plan. Right? Um, and, and as we start stepping out, we start developing our skills, God will give us the opportunities. God is not going to open a door when he doesn't see us acting in faith. And on Sunday, yesterday, what did we talk about? Acting out our faith, right? If, if we have the faith, hey, I have faith that one day I will start my own business. Wonderful. Got to put it in plan. Now you're 25, 30, but that's still on paper. 35, it's still on paper. 40, it's still on paper. What's happening? You have the plan, but we're not stepping out. Get started. We need to pray, listen to God, and step up. Right? I'll give you this example. In 2018, when I had, I had, we had, I had a dream, and in that dream, I think I've shared this before. Uh, uh, in the dream, you know, I knew that. So 2018 was almost, almost eight, seven years that I'd been working, and I knew, I knew that this season is there's a change. I just knew it. Right? Something is going to change in my life. Uh, I knew that. Something is going to change. I just knew it in my heart. So I remember I just went to work office like a regular day. And then Pastor had called me in and he said, There's an opportunity to build a church in Mangalore. Right? Uh, so the church in Mangalore is about 15 people, Paul. Would you be willing to go? Now, was it a was it something that's easy? For me in my mind. I didn't think about the children. I didn't think about anything. I said, yes, right there. Because I knew that God had already prepared me for a change. A change was already there in my mind. I was ready for it. So when, when I was asked about it, I said, yes. But now, after saying yes, there were so many things to get done. Right? Moving to Mangalore, children. Children were very small, very small. Okay, getting a place there, so much of practical work to get done. Right? And when we went there, the church was still small. There was no structure in the church. We had to start from zero, but we enjoyed it. But, but one thing is, I knew that this is what God wanted me to do. I knew. After four years, God spoke to me and said, I'm going to take you back to a land. Right? I, I just knew it. I'm going to take you back to the land that which... I have called you to be in. I thought, what, what, what land is this? Like Old Testament, <laughs> the, the land which I'm going to. Then I realized, hey, God is saying, I'm going to take you back. The season is over. Then I said, God, if, if I have to go back, somebody has to be here in the church. Who will look after the church? This, the person who comes to this church must know how to lead worship, because we don't have worship leaders. He must know how to play an instrument. He must know how to, uh, you know, he should be a youth, right? like a young person, uh, because there are a lot of youths here. Until somebody comes here, I'm not going back. And then at the right time, you know, there was a pastor available. I think you all met Pastor John. Pastor John. 
It was a way he said yes. He went, I came. Everything worked out perfectly. And so when God orchestrates something, right, we need to step out. That's the point I'm trying to make. Right? Not for doors to be open. Proverbs 16:1. The preparations of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. When there is a workplace, when you enter into a workplace, you will have to knock for doors to be open. Not always opportunity comes and doors will open just like that. We need to knock. Yes? But how do we knock? We don't aggressively knock. We don't break the door down. Right? And say, it's me and I'm coming and I'm entering this. No. We knock. Right? And what does it mean? If an opportunity comes, it's there. You've knocked, it comes. Take it up. Right? Take up that opportunity. Right? And uh, as you go through this knocking process, do your best to prepare. Now, for example, you want to start your own business. And you're knocking, you're looking for investors, you're knocking. Hey, who's going to help me start my business? You're looking, you're knocking for investors. Of course, first you ask God, but in the natural also, you're, you're knocking. You're, you're uh, you know, looking for investors. As you're doing that, what does it say here? In the knocking process, do your best to prepare. Now picture this, you're knocking for, uh, for you know, people to invest in your company. And you say, hey, suddenly somebody comes and says, I'm willing to invest in your company. Tell me what is it about your company? And this fellow has one paper. He's written in the paper what my company is. Tell me, will the investor give him even one rupee? He's written in the paper. A4 size sheet paper. This is what my company is. It's not going to work. We need to be able to present ourselves well. Present. You need to have a, a whole Word document or a PPT and presentation. Say, okay, this is what my company is. This is what I see that's going to happen in the first three years. After the first five years, we may get some returns. In 10 years, this is what the company, the valuation of the company can be. And so you're giving targets. You're, you're, you've done your homework. Then the investors say, okay, I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to give you. Now imagine you've been knocking, knocking, knocking. Investor comes and you've written on the paper and then you show the paper. This is what my business is. He'll say, okay, thank you. And he'll go. So be prepared or prepare yourself even as you're knocking. Now how about we um, look at it in ministry? You want to start a church. You're knocking for opportunities. You are Give me the right opportunity or the right time or the right place to start. Give me some, you know, uh, connect me to some pastors or some leaders who can help me to start. These are the things that I need to start. And then somebody comes and says, hey, I will support you and your ministry. What is your, what is your church all about? What is the vision of the church? Oh, that I haven't done yet. But after you support me, I will do the vision. You'll say, you first do the vision and you come back. You understand why is it important to prepare, right? We need to pray, listen, prepare, and step out, right? Uh, even knock on open doors, keep preparing. Don't get discouraged if the first door you knock does not open wide. Page 20 on uh, the top portion in the books. Don't get discouraged if the first door you knock does not swing open wide. Right? You know, how many of you know John Wesley? The old preacher in church history, not the new John Wesley's you see. The uh, the the great uh, John Wesley, the Methodist preacher. John Wesley is said to be one of the most renowned preachers in the world. Right? With over forty thousand sermons he has preached, touched many lives started the whole Methodist movement, known for his uh, very uh, eloquent speech and wonderful sermons. You know that John Wesley, when he first began preaching, they rejected him. They said, he's no good. He's not a good preacher. He cannot be a good orator. He cannot stand in front of people and talk. So 
there will be times when what you want to do, people will say you're not good enough. But carry on. Continue to open doors. Continue to ask for open doors. Right? Uh, John Wesley went on when he began to, you know, if you read his documentary, he's very powerful. He called his brother and he said, you, he was a musician and a singer. So he would sing a song, John Wesley would preach, and few people would come and listen. But what started that way went on to become a big movement and then became a revival in the nation of England. Right? So when don't be discouraged when those doors don't open. Pursue. Be persistent. Right? Even as you are being persistent, expect unusual favor from God. Let's read that verse. Genesis 39 and verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor. You know, favor is very important. Without God's favor, it's very hard to be successful. Whether in ministry, whether in the corporate, whether you have your own business. Without the favor of God, it's very, very difficult. We need God's favor. I, I think the perfect example of favor would be that of Nehemiah. That's the favor of God. If you, if you see, read the first few portions of Nehemiah. When you read it, we will understand that this is the favor of God. Why? The people destroyed the walls of Jerusalem. They burned the gates. Now here is Nehemiah. He's saying, he's feeling bad. He goes to the king. He says, we know the story, right? He goes to the king and he says, the walls of Jerusalem are broken. The gates are burnt. I want to rebuild it. The king had a choice. During those days, you can't just go to a king and talk whatever you feel like talking. Now, it was the favor of God that Nehemiah had access to the king. He was a cupbearer. But even being a cupbearer, you can't just talk whatever you want. Right? Uh, and that is, you're talking about Jerusalem. You're talking about a, a nation who's the enemy to the, the king who's sitting there. And Nehemiah is saying, the walls of Jerusalem is broken, it's burned down. So the king could have said, don't enter this place again and just, you know, banished him from the kingdom or the king could have said terminate him finish him off he could have said it right but he didn't say it what did he say am i what is wrong why are you so weary so, oh the gates are burned okay what do you need that's the favor of god what do you need i need this i need this number one i need papers Give me approvals that I can go and start building the wall. King says, okay. First favor. Two, give me material so that I can go and build the wall. Okay, approved. Give me people also. Few people I need. Four, is it okay if I ask the people of, uh, in the surrounding areas to help build the wall? Yes, go ahead. Everything Nehemiah asked for was granted by the king. Everything. That is called the favor of God. When God's favor is upon us, it's an unusual thing. When people see us, they will do unusual things. It's an unusual favor. Right? Look at Daniel also. Right? He was there, a young man. God's favor was upon him. And now the, the third kingdom has come, the Medes and the Persians. The, the the kingdom the uh, Babylonian kingdom is overpowered, and this uh, the new kingdom third kingdom has come. What does he say? What does Darius say? The king says, "See, I've heard about you, Daniel, that you have done very well. So I want you to look after the uh, have everything that happens in the government. You should look after it." Daniel didn't go running and saying, "See, actually, when I was 17 years old, I came and I I was here." He didn't have to explain anything. The Raya said, I've heard about you. You be the governor. You be the ruler of all that happens in the nation. The favor of God. 
you and I, when we are planning and preparing for things that God has for us, expect the unusual favor of God. You, you may have people who are high in the ministry or big leaders. They can come and call you and say, I want you to help me in this. Or you may have people who are high in the corporate saying, hey, I want to help you in certain things or I want I want you to I want to help you start a business this is the unusual favor of God expect it right and there are plenty of examples if you read through the Bible I mean in, uh, even in church history we read of plenty of examples of the favor of God we need God's favor upon our life right uh, uh, another another example that I can just a very practical example and I think I've said this many, many times. Uh, uh, you know, when we we went to when we were in Mangalore, we went there and uh, we wanted to do carols in the mall, right? And and when we entered the mall, we we just went and asked them, "Can we do carols?" That person in the office, administrative office, he said, "Just write a letter and give it to us." I wrote a letter, gave it to him. Now I just wrote a letter saying we want to do carols. But you know what is favor? Suddenly I realized who's going to bring the equipment? And who's going to bring the mixer, the speakers, the cables, the mics? There's so much that has to be. Who's going to bring all of that? Right? And I remember just praying. I went back home and I said, God, I should have done it this way, but what do I do now? If I get the permission, how do I, you know? Put it across that I need the sound system. Now, hiring sound system is expensive, right? It would take about thirty to forty thousand only to hire the equipment. Now, why would they want to do it for me? Who am? Who are we? Nothing. We just ask, can we do carols? Right. That's all we ask for. And and so I remember we, uh, you know, they approved it, and I went to the office again and said, uh, see. We want to uh, thank you for giving the approvals. So what about the sound system? That's all I asked. So what about the sound system? Oh, sound system. Uh, so in my heart, I was praying. I prayed. I said, God, when I ask for this, they should agree. Otherwise, the whole plan is gone. How will I do this? Oh, sound system. Uh, that guy was, I remember very clearly, he was thinking. And he said, OK, I'll uh, connect you to the events team guy. He will talk to you. So he gave me his number. I called him and I went to him. He, they were all they all work in the mall itself, right? In, in the basement, the office there. I went to him and said, see, we've got approval for carols. Oh, yes. The manager spoke to me. Tell me what all you need. Write it down in this paper. <laughs> I wrote down two speakers, three mixers, 10 cables, 10 jack to jacks. I wrote drum kit. Right, and it's drum kit and put everything. And he saw it and all. He said, Okay, do you know any vendors here? I said, I don't know anyone because I'm from Bangalore. Okay, don't worry, we'll get it done. We came, I came one day before, this is in 2018, right? I came one day before the carols. I came to the mall just to make sure that you know what they've done? They made a big stage, decorated the stage, made light spotlights with sound system. And I said, this is the favor of God. Everyone came and they were listening. Now, I didn't ask for stage. I didn't ask for spotlights. I, 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 but all of this was just done. And because of that one mall, one guy from there, you know, works in another mall. He came up straight to me and he said, give me your name and number. I gave it to him. He said, there are places, other malls here. I'll, I'll give you the permission. You can do it in all these malls. The following year, we did in about five malls. Then colleges. One guy was in, uh, one of the students came up to me and said, you know, this is a college here. Can you come and do the concert here? I said, yeah, we'll come. So doors just open by what? It's a simple letter that I wrote. I want to do carols. I say unusual favor. Even this December, you know, the team went in Mangalore. They, they did carols. And we can keep doing it for the next 20, 30 years. They will give it to us. Why? This is the favor of God. The moment we say all people's church, we've come to do cows, they know us. They will give it to us. 
That's what favor does, unusual favor. And we should pray for that. We should ask God for that favor upon our lives, right? Next, you can build only after you settle down. So stop wandering. Let's read Proverbs 27 and verse 8. People who want settle, settle down, wandering hider and and yon are like restless uh, words, fleeting to and fro. Yeah. Now transitions are natural, right? We go to one one season to another, but there will come a time you'll have to settle down, right? God will make you stay, okay, stay here. Here is where I want you to build. Right? Restless birds don't build a nest. They don't lay eggs and they don't have young ones. So they don't increase, they don't grow. They're just wandering from place to place. Now that's not what God wants for us. Yes, there will be transitions, but there will come a time. Right, where you will be established. God will say, Yeah, you, you settle down here, you you build on what I'm giving you right now. Right? So, for example, how many of you are working before joining Bible college? <laughs> were working, right? All of you are working. So now you left your work. It's a transition. Yes or no? And right? from the workplace to Bible college. So now it's a transition. You're studying in Bible college. And now again, you're going to be a there's going to be a transition after some time. Get back to work or get back to ministry, whatever that God wants you to do. Or you want to study more also, it's fine. But there's going to be a transition, no matter what. Right? Now, as you transition, be open to the transition, but also look to God and understand, OK, is this where God wants me to build? Right? Now, we don't know how many transitions God may take us through. He may take us to two, three, four, five transitions, or maybe just one transition. For example, one transition, you're studying, you go abroad, you get a job, you work, you start your ministry, whatever, and you're done. One transition in life, what? one place to another. But then there are other people, God will do a two or three transitions. Right? You go here, from there he'll send you to another place, or he may ask you to start something, he may ask you to close down something. Transitions will be there. But at one point, there's a place where you have to settle down. Now, when I say settle down, it means not, okay, this is my job, I'm going to do this. No, meaning build on what God is giving you in that time. Okay, You know, okay, this is what God wants me to do. Resist the temptation of randomly jumping from one job to another. You know, now when you look at what's happening, people jump, no? One job to another. This company is paying me 5,000 rupees more. So I will move from this job to another. But you've been in this company for five years. For 5,000, five years, you five years of, of work, you're just going to throw it away? Right? So we need to be wise on how we make the transitions. Don't be like birds moving from one place to another, right? Because five years, you worked hard for five years. You can't just leave it just because you know somebody else became a manager or somebody else was given more Christmas gifts. That's not how it works, right? We 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 need to understand transitions. We need to understand where God wants us and how we can build on what God is giving us, right? I remember I had a friend and. Um, He's still my friend, but I don't get to talk to him much. But uh, he was in a very good job, right? Uh, you know, high in, a, in the same place where I used to work. And his job was nothing. He basically was getting paid to do very little work. Everyone wanted a job like him. Right? All he would do is the new batches will come. He will train the new batches. OK, you speak like this. You talk like this. You know, communications and uh, people building. All the other time he was free. Now, what happened was everyone used to envy him. Hey, you're getting paid for doing nothing. You know, 
maybe in an eight hour shift he would work three hours five hours he's free and he'll be simply walking around in the office we used to be so upset with him but this guy because of that freedom one day what happened was his, his manager came and was upset that some work didn't get done and shouted at him hey you shouldn't have done this you should have done it i asked you to he got so upset, he went home and he put his papers down. He said, I'm quitting the job. He sent the email. Now, after sending the email, he thought, oh, what have I done? Uh, so he's, he wrote another email. The next day, he went to office and all. They have all called him. They made him sit. They said, OK, so for your exit interview, you have to do this, this, this. These. So he said, no, 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 I want to stay. I just uh, was upset that. Uh, uh, you know, that you, the manager shouted at me, so I put my papers. No, we accepted the, your resignation, so now we don't need your services. That, that, what he did, till now, he regrets it. Because he's saying, if I was there, he had opportunities to go abroad. He, he never got a job like what he had. He says, I did a foolish thing. Right, so what am I trying to say? Be wise when we, you know, don't just move, just don't let situations dictate your plans and your careers. Look to God, let God dictate it, let God speak into you. Right now, take okay, there's two more minutes. Okay, we'll take a break, we'll come back, and uh, we'll continue.